uh, power is something that most Pentecostals and Charismatics think of immediately when they think of the Holy Spirit's work in the Christian life because we're mindful of one of our favorite verses, uh, Acts 1.8, for you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person or when a person is said to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we are aware that power is one of the manifestations of the Spirit and that power may well be demonstrated in powerful gifts like signs, wonders, you know, miracles, healings, supernatural displays of, of supernatural power. And uh, that certainly is true. Uh, unfortunately, in at least some circles, Christians have come to see that as the main and most important manifestation of the Spirit. Paul acknowledges that the Spirit gives us power. But he goes on and says, and love. And love, of course, is more character-oriented. It's something that is a, a fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.22. And love is that which changes the way we relate with people. It has to do with our character and, and the quality of our relating with each other. It is, of course, the great commandment. And only the Holy Spirit can make us capable of it. That is, of loving. In Romans 5.5, 5, Paul said that uh, uh, the, the, the love of God is shed abroad or poured out in our lives by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5. 5. And then, of course, Galatians 5.22 tells us that love is the fruit of the Spirit, is the fruit of the Spirit. So, the, the Spirit gives us power, which we usually think of in, in terms of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but also love, which is, one of, is the principal fruit of the Spirit, and then of a sound mind. Now, the word sound mind is translated variously in different uh, translations. Some actually translate self-control. I'm curious, what does the New American Standard translate that for? Discipline. Discipline. Self-control, discipline is a thought. Anyone have a different translation that has a different word there? Discipline, self-control. The King James and the New King James both use the term sound mind. The Greek word is also translated elsewhere as sensible. Sensible. Now, sensible can mean in terms of the way you think, and therefore rendered a sound mind. Or it can mean in behavior, that you behave in a sensible fashion that your behavior is governed by good sense rather than by impulse, which would be like being disciplined or self-controlled. A person who is governed by good sense uh, must do so by suppressing appetites that, that, and impulses that are not sensible. And therefore, being sensible in terms of behavior requires self-control. And therefore, though the word in the Greek means sensible, uh, translators could choose sound mind or discipline as various options as, as far as how Paul means to apply that term. Uh, the Spirit of God is said to have a positive effect on our soundness of mind. The Bible says in, in, in Ephesians 4.23 that we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And of course, a very similar sounding verse in Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This renewing process is by the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Well, because of the word transformed. In Romans 12, 2, where it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, this word metamorphosized is found in only one other place in the epistles. And that is in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, where Paul says, we are being transformed or metamorphosized from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this word metamorphosized in Romans 12, 2, is found also in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, both speak of a transformation of our character. In Romans, it is associated with the transformation of our thinking processes. In Second Corinthians, the thinking processes are not singled out for attention, but, but the, the development or the sanctification of our character from glory to glory is mentioned. And it is said to be through the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God changes our character. The Spirit of God does give us a, a new mind or a, a different mind. Uh, after all, in Romans 8, Paul says that those who are uh, in the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit, that they're, they're spiritually minded. And those who are in the flesh mind the things of the flesh. They're carnally minded. So the mind of the person who is governed by the Spirit of God is uh, definitely in a different condition than the mind of the person who is in the flesh. That is in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8, verses 5 and 6. If, on the other hand, we understand sound mind and 
First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 to, to mean discipline or self-controlled, which is preferred by some translators, there is a parallel to that too in Romans chapter 8. And that is in Romans 8.13. In Romans 8.13 it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Putting to death the deeds of the body is the opposite of simply indulging the lust of the flesh. And to deny the lust of the flesh for reigning your life is discipline. It is self-control. And Paul indicates that this is accomplished through the Spirit. So we could, we could side with the King James or with the other translations in what Paul means when he says the, the spirit of a sound mind or sensibleness. Uh, it could be that he's speaking of the work of the Spirit to change the way we think yeah. or the way we discipline ourselves and overcome impulses uh, of the flesh toward doing evil. In any case, either would be agreeable with other passages. Even even both ideas would be found in Romans 8. And maybe both are implied. It's possible that sensible means sensible in the way we think and in the way we act. And uh, at any rate, the Spirit of God is uh, is invaluable to the Christian because of the things that, that we receive. Love, power, and uh, all that we really need for life and godliness, as it turns out. Verse 8 <coughs> 2 Timothy 1.8 Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner. There we first learn that Paul is in prison. He's a prisoner now. But share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Now the power of God is what Timothy needs if he's going to make this death divine visit to Rome. Paul says don't be ashamed of me. Don't stand aloof from me just because I happen to be in a humiliating and dangerous situation. Some have stood aloof. Some have forsaken me. Uh, but don't be like them. Don't be ashamed of my situation or of my chains. Come and participate with me in the sufferings of the gospel. Not in your own strength, but by the power of God. And he's already mentioned the power of God in verse 7. That's through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that gives us is a spirit of power. Uh, Timothy, if you are afraid to come, God will give you the power to do what is against your nature. Come and participate and endure sufferings with me by God's power. Uh, don't be ashamed of the, of the gospel. The very issue for which Paul is probably in prison is for preaching the gospel. That might make some people at that time want to distance themselves from the gospel. The way you distance yourself from someone that you're ashamed of. He says, don't be ashamed. Don't distance yourself. Don't be aloof from the gospel, even though it's that very thing that may put you in prison with me. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be aloof from me, even though association with me might also put you in prison. This word ashamed appears three times in this chapter. He tells Timothy not to be ashamed of the gospel or of Paul. Later in verse 12 he says, For this reason I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And then later when he talks about Onesiphorus, a good man, of whom we know nothing except what Paul says here, it says in verse 18, The Lord grant him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well, uh, not that verse, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 16. The Lord grants mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chain. He tells in verse 17 how Onesiphorus had arrived in Rome to see Paul, and he diligently sought him out, though at great personal risk. The very thing that he's telling Timothy to do. He says, Now Onesiphorus wasn't ashamed of my chain, therefore don't you be ashamed of me, the prisoner of the Lord. Uh, so ashamed here has to do with, uh, if a person is ashamed in this sense, it has to do with their being not willing to associate with the uh, humiliating circumstances that Paul is in. And uh, he says, Timothy, don't be ashamed. Uh, Onesiphorus was not ashamed. And I am not ashamed, he says in verse 12. Okay, verse 9, uh, after he's mentioned God, he cannot help but go into a, a somewhat, uh, you know, a, you know how Paul is about this. He says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now this expression before time began uh, is not the greatest possible translation. The way it is worded may give the impression that time and eternity are separate entities, and there is you know time as we know it, the succession of events measurable. Uh, it may be something that began at a certain time and will end at a certain time. 
There are, in fact, those Christian philosophers who believe that's exactly the case. C.S. Lewis, for example, believes that time and eternity are separate realms. And uh, following Lewis, I think an awful lot of Christians have held that view, too. Actually, Plato first taught that, and uh, Augustine, if I'm not mistaken, also taught that. And Lewis has popularized it. And it may be true. We don't know if it's true. The Bible doesn't teach it clearly anywhere. If this translation is to be preferred, before time began, that would give strong support to the notion that time had a beginning and that there were things happened before time began. And then they, they must, if they're not in time, they must be in eternity. And that we would make, therefore, a distinction between time and eternity. The problem is with the translation. Now, the, the NIV, surprisingly, follows the King James fairly closely in translating this because I think the NIV just says before the beginning of time. And in this, both the King James and the NIV are not very close to the original because the original literally says before time is eternal. That God gave us this grace in Christ is before times eternal. Now, obviously, that expression is difficult. What does before times eternal mean? Obviously, the NIV and the King James believe that that means before the beginning of time. Some translators prefer uh, ages ago or something like that, or from ancient times or something like that. So we can't be sure that the strange expression, which occurs here and also occurs in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time again, or, or the same expression, uh, before time is eternal. <coughs> Titus 1, 2, and here in First Timothy 1, 9 are the only two places this expression is found. We can't be sure that it is teaching a beginning to what we call time. Although before times certainly may sound a little bit like that, which is a little translation, but then adding the word eternal only makes it sound <coughs> grammatically strange. We don't... It may mean that eternity or the realm of the eternal is or existed before times, in which case that would again support the notion that time and eternity are separate entities, although we cannot be too dogmatic. And there are many Christians who object to the suggestion that time and eternity are not, that there is no time in eternity. You know, you know the concept. You've heard people say, you know, in, in eternity it's all just the eternal now. And uh, the problem with that is, of course, the suggestion is that there is no time with God. He lives in the realm of eternity, and therefore there's no past, present, or future for him. And yet, throughout the scripture, we read of God doing things before he did something else. Some spiritual things, heavenly things, which, I mean, the, the language of time is used, whether as a concession to our limited term of reference or, or because it's really so, that there's a progression of events, even in God's activities in, in heaven. And if there is, then that's what we call time, a succession of events, one happening before another and one happening after another. Uh, so I, I am a, a little suspicious of the notion that God lives in eternal now in, in a realm called eternity that is uh, not relevant to time at all, but it may be true we simply don't have enough data of Scripture. I just want to point out that if you have a translation of this verse that gives uh, support to that notion, that support is probably due to a a not very exact translation of the Greek expression, which is really before times eternal. Not a major point of importance, but it may be the sum. <coughs> now, interesting, verse 9 actually is a very good Calvinist verse, uh, because it says uh, that God has called us, not according to our works, possibly meaning not according to anything we have done, but according to his own purpose and grace. And, of course, the Calvinist view is that God elected us and called us, not with reference to anything we have done or would do, <clears throat> but simply by God's own sovereign, unexplained purposes, and by His sovereign grace. And that He gave us this grace and this calling before time began, or, or uh, if we don't even accept that translation, certainly from ancient times, before we were ever born, He gave us this grace. Now, as you know, I, I have felt that the pastoral epistles are one of the wealthiest sources of non-Calvinistic statements. And it's interesting, and it shows the very nature of the Calvinist Arminius today, that some strong, seemingly Calvinist statements can appear in the same epistles as some strong non-Calvinist uh, statements. And I certainly think, for instance, that chapter 2, verse 12 of this epistle is a strongly anti-Calvinist statement, which is, if we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Denying Christ will mean that, that he will deny us. And he, Paul, includes himself in that proposition, we. So, I mean, here's, a, you know, here's an interesting thing. 
We also find it to be true in other places where some of the strongest Calvinistic statements are found, or we also find some of the strongest Arminian statements. The book of John, for example, is a, and, and the book of Romans. Those two books are uh, sources for a large number of statements in favor of Calvinistic propositions. In John, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whosoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. And words like that have, have been used a great deal by Calvinists. Yet it's also in John that Jesus says, You are the branches, and any branch that does not abide in me will be cut off and cast into the fire. Which does not sound like it supports eternal security or perseverance of the saints necessarily. Likewise, Romans uh, is thought to, to, to prove Calvinism. And, you know, Romans chapter 8. You know, what sh- nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. It says there. And yet it's also in Romans chapter 11 that it says that we are branches grafted on by faith into God's olive tree, and if we don't continue in faith, we'll be cut off, just like the unbelieving Jewish branches were. So, I mean, it's an interesting phenomenon that the nature of this controversy is such that you don't just have one book that, that teaches one of these doctrines, and another book that seems to be in conflict with it, but the doctrines are strongly supported, both sides seem to find their strong support from the same books, in some cases. And uh, what that tells me is that we don't have one author who's got strong Calvinist leanings and another one who has strong Arminian leanings, but that the truths that the Calvinists are trying to lay hold of and that the Arminians are trying to lay hold of must have some, somehow be harmonious more than is it evident on the surface. I mean, this seems like these are contradictory things, but that Paul, in these various places, and, and the Gospel of John, for example, could contain some of the strongest statements on both sides suggest that one thinker with one homogenous theological viewpoint could embrace both of these concepts and therefore there must be the truth lying somewhere in you know there must be something to both of them and our task and it's not a simple one by the way is to find out where the truth lies and it must be a truth that accommodates all the facts and uh, we've talked about this before we don't have time to go into it now but certainly anyone who wants to take an arrogant Arminian position is going to have to look pretty hard at, at 2 Timothy 1 9 because it seems to suggest that God's calling of us is not based on what we have done, but what God purposed in his sovereignty and grace to do, and he purposed to call you in the ancient ages before you ever were a twinkle in your mother's eye. So it's obvious that foreknowledge and predestination and election are, are implied in this. Though I would stress that when he says not according to our works, this does not necessarily support unconditional election, though some might use it that way. He does not say, not according to our faith. If he said, not according to our faith, then it would seem to mean, you know, God had no, found nothing in us to explain why he would choose us. But he said, not according to our works, and throughout the epistles, uh, that is the pastoral epistles especially, there is a stress on good works in terms of righteous behavior and righteous acts. And even the Arminian would agree that though God did choose us because he foresaw that we would have faith, he did not choose us because of any good works we had done. So that is agreeable, depending on what you understand by not, a, not according to our works. Uh, an Arminian could agree with that and say it's true. It wasn't because of our good works that God called us. It's because of his grace. We all acknowledge that. But the Arminian would say there is something we did. There is something in our activities that, that influenced God to choose us, and that was that he foresaw that we would believe the gospel. And the Calvinists would say, no, that's not, that's not a factor. Okay, so it's interesting, interesting uh, dilemma. Verse ten, continuing from the statement that God has given us this in Christ Jesus before time began, it says, "But has now revealed." In contrast to before time began, now He has revealed it by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day, or the kingdom of against that day. Now, Paul stresses in verse 10 again, life and immortality. This word immortality is a pretty rare one in the New Testament. He has used it though in 1 Timothy, where he also stressed life and immortality. In 1 Timothy 6.13, 1 Timothy 
13. Paul says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And then down in verse 16, 1 Timothy 6, 16, speaking of Jesus, it says, who alone has immortality. So in that little section in 1 Timothy 6, verses 13 through 16, there is a stress on God giving life to all things and Him possessing immortality. Now also here in 1 Timothy, verse, I mean 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, he says, God, according to the promise of life, and now in verse 10, uh, he has brought immortality and life to light. It's interesting that he says has brought immortality and life, uh, life and immortality to light. It's like it was there, but no one saw it before. Jesus had to turn on the light to show it to us. There were people in the Old Testament who experienced life and immortality. Certainly, there were saved people who had eternal life in the Old Testament. But it was never very clearly discussed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not very explicit in describing what happens to people after they die. Both heaven and hell are fairly shady concepts in the Old Testament. It did not seem to be part of God's concern to reveal these matters in the Old Testament. But in Christ, in the Revelation of Christ, there's a great deal of information given about the immortal state of man and the and eternal life and so forth. There's, there's a very clear dichotomy in terms of emphasis on these points between the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament is mainly concerned with promising physical blessings, physical, you know, benefits, long life, prosperity, and so forth to those who are godly. And the great threat of the Old Testament to the wicked is that they're going to die. In the New Testament, however, the, the great concern is eternal. He says it's more, better to enter into life maimed or blind than to be whole and be cast into the lake of fire. And the eternal issues are much more brought to light in the New Testament than in the Old. They were they were in existence in the Old Testament, just like demons and the devil were in existence in the Old Testament, but are hardly mentioned. I'm sure that demons were as active in Old Testament times as in the New, but we read of them frequently in the New Testament and seldom in the Old. And uh, you know, certain spiritual issues, though they were in they were realities in Old Testament, they were not brought to light. But Jesus, through His the revelation he has given us has brought certain things to life that were somewhat hazy and in the shadows before, like life, immor- you know, eternal life and immortality. Now, in that connection, verse 10 says that Jesus has abolished death. The word abolished there in the Greek is katergeo. One of the few Greek words I know. Uh, katergeo, uh, one reason I know it is because uh, in some of my special interests there are some verses that use this word where it's, it's, trans- its interpretation is important. Catergeo means to reduce to inactivity or to render inactive. Catergeo means to reduce to inactivity or to render inactive. But by implication, it may mean a variety of things. Some translators in this case would like to use the word annul. He has annulled death as if to cancel the death sentence, as it were. But uh, the interesting thing is that the Bible says elsewhere that he has done the same thing, Catergeo, uh, the devil. Yeah. Catergeo? Yeah. Exactly as you'd expect. K-A-T-A-R G-E-O K-A-T-A-R G-E-O This word is used in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 where it says that Jesus has destroyed him that had the power of death, even the devil, were destroyed as together. He has reduced the devil to inactivity. Here it says he has reduced death to inactivity. Now it's very interesting that both death and the devil still are active. In, I mean, if you don't believe it, go step out in front of a freight train. Uh, you'll find at least that death is still uh, alive and well, as it were. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15.26, in 15.26 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about the resurrection. He's talking about eschatology. He's talking about the end. And he talks about the, he says, uh, first, you know, everyone's resurrected in their own time. First Christ, later, afterwards, those who are his at his coming. After that is the end. When Christ will have offered up all things to his Father and so forth. Then it says, for the last enemy to be destroyed, Catergeo, will be death. Now the interesting thing there is that Paul is looking at the resurrection as the ultimate destruction or catergeo of death. Yet here he speaks of it in the past tense. Christ has already catergeo of death. 
Now it seems like Paul can't make up his mind. What is his theology on this? Did Jesus render death inactive already? Or is that going to happen at the resurrection, as is implied in 1 Corinthians 15, 26? Well, obviously both are true in, in different senses. But Jesus accomplished at the cross has not yet really been manifest in history, but it has been manifest to us in our experience. Just like we have not yet seen the appearance of the new heavens and new earth, but if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. As 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us. And in Hebrews chapter 6, we're told that Christians are those who have already tasted of the powers of the world to come. The world to come hasn't come, but we have already tasted the power of it. That's in Hebrews 6, probably verse 4 or 5, I don't remember exactly which verse. Now, there are certain things that Jesus accomplished and purchased which will be revealed and universally known at a certain point in the future. But for us as individuals, we have already experienced the powers of that world to come. We have already become a new creation. We've already come, stepped into it. It's already ours in Christ. It will be universally realized at a later date. Likewise, the destruction and the, the, the annulling and the rendering inactive of death and the devil, by the way. Yeah. It, it is eschatological when we say that when Jesus comes he's going to throw the devil in the lake of fire and he's going to bring the new heavens and the new earth. But we can say, in a sense, since eschatology has already broken into our own experience in Christ, the age to come has already been tasted of by us, that for us, death is already dead. For us, the devil's already rendered inactive. Not that he can't do anything to us, but we have the power to counteract everything he may try to do. It's as, it's as good as if he were inactive, and the same thing is true of death. It's not that we won't physically die, but death really doesn't hurt us, because it just... It's just the, you know, coronation into our reigning with Christ forever. And so, there's a sense in which the things Jesus accomplished in destroying death and destroying Satan and rendering them inactive, it's true already in our experience. But it's not universally realized or manifested yet. That will be later. Just like when Paul says in Romans 8 that the whole creation groans and travails awaiting the time when the sons of God will be manifested. Yes. As an individual, then we don't have like what you call or realize that the quality of as a as a corporate body is good. Say it again. Um, as individuals, then we would have the potential to say it's an over-realized eschatology that our experience would say, yes, we think that happened. But as a universal it body, not yet. It's not right. yet. It's here, but not yet. Or how? Exactly. It's, it's the now and not yet. Yeah. Yeah, the already and the not yet is really how many scholars like to talk about eschatology. There's a sense in which the spiritual dimension of that is, is already realized by those who have come into Christ. The... Uh, the not yet part is that which where the entire universe will be, you know, will become a reflection of these realities. At this point, only our lives are reflections of those realities, but they are not manifest universally until Jesus returns. Uh, uh, Eric, does First John three eight use the word katergeo? Katergeo, this person's son of God was manifest, he might destroy. I don't believe katergeo is there. Uh, I, I wish it were, but I, as I, I've done some work on Katergeo, and I don't recall that being one of the verses that it appears in. I, I'm afraid I don't have a Greek text in front of me, or else I could say it's right over there. But uh, I think I could say it's not Katergeo there. You can check that later if you'd like. I will say this, though. This already not yet stuff. Um, in Romans chapter 8, it talks about the creation groaning and travailing, waiting for the time that it will be delivered from corruption. And it says in Romans 8, 18 and, and 19, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing, or the manifestation of the sons of God. There is a glory that will be revealed in us when Jesus returns. And the creation eagerly awaits that because it too will be released from its subjection to decay as he goes on to explain at that time but notice there, the creation looks forward to a time when there will be a revelation of what is already true we are already the sons of God but that revelation awaits the second coming of Christ that is the world does not yet acknowledge we are John says in 1 John chapter 3 beloved now we are the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be but when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is notice we are now the sons of God but it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We already experience sonship 
but the world doesn't recognize that. That will be manifested. And when it is, it will be at the coming of Christ when we're glorified in him and where the world itself experiences total change. So, we can talk about what Jesus did death as something already accomplished at the cross, but as far as its ultimate final destruction of death, and the end of the experience of death for, you know, in, in, in all the universe, and that's going to be later at the resurrection. Okay, now, verse um, 11 he says, to which I was appointed a preacher and apostle to teach of the Gentiles. This is uh, agreeable with what he said elsewhere in First Timothy. For this reason, I also suffer these things. What reason? Well, one, because he was appointed a preacher to the Gentiles. That's why he suffered. But also prior to that, he said, because God has abolished death, he has brought life and immortality life, and because of that too, Paul is willing to suffer the things he does. He's suffering because he's a preacher to the Gentiles, but he's also willing to suffer as such, because he knows that death is really no, nothing terrifying to the Christian. And because he is aware and has been enlightened about life and immortality, therefore he goes ahead into the dangerous situations he does for the gospel's sake and suffers these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. You know, in spite of the fact that loyalty to the gospel has brought such disaster in his own life in terms of personal comfort and, and liberty, that does not cause him to wish to stand aloof from it. Um, he still remains vehement in his preaching. The gospel is something he's not ashamed of. He has he said, all, you know, in Romans, I mean, yeah, Romans uh, one sixteen, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believes. But he says, I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. Yeah. Whom I have believed clearly is God or Jesus or Paul. But he says, I not only believe in him, but I know him. I, I have a relationship with him. It's not just a theological concept that there's a God. God is not just a conclusion or a proposition based on evidence that I consider to be compelling. God is a person that I know. I know the one that I have put my faith in. I'm not putting my faith in some theological proposition. I'm putting my faith in a person who is a, I'm acquainted with, a person I'm in a relationship with. I know him. And therefore, I cannot fear and I cannot doubt and I cannot be pessimistic because I know the one uh, that I put my trust in and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Now, what did Paul commit to God? Well, uh, his own life, certainly. His own soul, he's committed to God and therefore he could say, I'm, you know, my own, my own eternal welfare and, and salvation, you know, in a, in a sense is in God's hands and he'll, he'll keep me safe until that day. It's also a fact that back in chapter 14 of Acts, when he and Barnabas uh, appointed elders in every church and had to leave them, he also committed them to God. In other words, his children of faith, his churches that he had established were things that he had committed to God. And he knew that he was now going to be put to death. He couldn't, you know, hold the hand of these churches and, and pull, take, you know, counsel them through their trials and so forth. And and uh, write more epistles to them to straighten them out, he, he, they were going to be out of his hands. And he had committed them to God. Likewise, the church leaders that he would committed to God, some of them had already departed, but he, he had no reason for pessimism. He knew that his, the work he had done for his life was not going to be fruitless, ultimately, because he had committed it to God, and God would keep it. God is able. He knew that God would not allow his, his labor to come to nothing, and history has shown that Paul's labor did not come to nothing. The Romans tried to stop him from having further influence, but his influence actually later conquered the Roman Empire after his own death and, uh, and is in the process of doing the same in many countries today and even in, right here in this room. Uh, Paul's continued influence. Uh, with that which he committed to God, God was able and was faithful to uh, do to keep it. And now, by the way, this is a good verse for us, you know, with reference to our own sense of security as we face uncertain future. Uh, whether, you know, will I survive, spiritually speaking? Will my children be okay? And so forth. Um, whatever you've committed to God, He is certainly able to keep. And that's what He's saying. And, and the more you know God, the more you'll be persuaded of that fact. Persuasion is part of faith. Uh, being persuaded that God is able to keep this is, is what would cause you to be at peace in the face of uh, uncertain future. Now he says, God is able to keep that which I committed to him until that day. 
the question could rightly arise, what date does he have in mind? And the, the natural answer that we would come to would be uh, the second coming of Jesus, the judgment day. Uh, after all, he uses the same expression in verse 18, talking about Onesiphorus. The Lord grant him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. The same expression, in that day. Uh, Paul expects for whatever it is he's committed to God to be preserved until that day. He also expects Onesiphorus to experience God's mercy in that day. Certainly that day could mean the day of judgment. Easily. Uh, and since he doesn't specify which day, it may be that he intends them to understand it is a day of which he has spoken and written a great number of times. And there are, both in the writings of Paul and also in Jesus' teaching, frequent references to that day. Jesus said, in that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Many will say in that day. Uh, that day and that hour will come as a thief in the night. So it seems to be an eschatological day that he has in mind. The second coming of Christ and the attendant <coughs> resurrection and judgment and so forth of uh, people. And he says, I know that until that day, uh, whatever I have, even after I die, will be held uh, invol- inviolable. Uh, and that when it's brought up, when the books are open on that day, then I will be, you know, all that I've done will be still, uh, you know, mentioned in my favor. Time will not erase those things. Uh, now, it is also possible, this seems less likely to me, that that day may mean simply, the, generically, the day of a man's death, the end of his life, the last day of his life. In other words, he'd say, I believe that, you know, my soul will be kept by God and safe until death. Whereas others have strayed from the faith under persecution or even under less pressure than that, I'm not going to. God's going to keep me safely uh, in the faith until the day I die. And uh, that doesn't seem very likely to be the correct interpretation. I think he's talking about that philosophy, the second coming of Christ and the judgment. Now, verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words. It's interesting that in verse 12, he speaks of God's ability to keep things, and yet he encourages Timothy to hold fast to them. That is, that Timothy has to have some role in keeping them too. It's not just as some who put an, I think, an overemphasis on God's sovereignty would say, God alone is going to keep these things, you know, respect, irrespective of what we do. Nor is it as some extreme human free will teachers would say, it's just what we do, God has nothing to do with it. But God keeps, and we have to hold on to it too. And these two ideas are found throughout the scriptures. That God is the keeper, we are the ones who also have to be diligent to hold on to it to keep those things too. Keep yourselves in the love of God, Jude says. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, five that we are kept by the power of God through faith. The faith is what we bring to the situation. The power of God is what he brings and we are kept jointly by the power of God through faith, but that is by our believing. Now, <coughs> Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Faith and love obviously are the two principal virtues that Paul emphasizes most frequently. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So he's to hold fast we're supposed to do it through the power of the Spirit. Not to lose sight of the truth and the sound words we've got and the Holy Spirit is to be trusted to help him to do that. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, these two men we know nothing about other than here. Um, and that may be important in dating this, too, because if they were important in the days of the book of Acts, we probably would have read of them in the book of Acts. But these may have been men converted later than the events of the book of Acts, but now already departed from Paul. Now, when it says all those in Asia have turned from me, that's kind of scary. When you consider that Asia means Turkey where Paul had founded a number of churches, including the church of Ephesus, where this letter was sent to. And since Timothy was in Asia and hadn't turned from Paul, and no doubt some of those under Timothy's oversight certainly hadn't turned from Paul, we should understand all those who are in Asia should be not an absolute statement, but rather there's been a general turning from Paul in Asia. And even that might have been only temporary, since we read in the book of Revelation letters to seven churches that were in Asia that some of them seem to be doing relatively well. Um, so it may be that just at this time of crisis, some of those who have been converted by Paul, some of the churches that had been established by Paul, maybe most of them, 
were experiencing some serious shaking and were distancing themselves from him because, after all, Asia was a Roman province and if Paul was treated as a Roman criminal, uh, it may have been pretty, uh, not even pretty risky in, in that province to, uh, to you know, name yourself as someone associated with that man who may have been a very controversial criminal in Rome at that moment. And uh, so some of them had no doubt denied him before men, as it were, and uh, had uh, definitely not wished to be associated with him. Some of those were flagellous and homogeneous, uh, about whom we know nothing else about uh, except their defection. Now, it says, The Lord grant mercy, by contrast, to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant to him that he might find mercy in the day, uh, from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So Onesiphorus must have been from Ephesus, where Timothy lived. He was one of those from Asia, most of whom had turned away from Paul, but Onesiphorus was a notable example. He was not ashamed. He came to Rome and looked Paul up in order to minister to him. He knew that Paul was going to need a friend, and he came to minister to him. Now, if that's true, then Paul wouldn't... You know, we, we wonder, what had happened to Ones- Onesiphorus since then? What, did he stay with Paul? Paul doesn't send greetings from Onesiphorus along with greetings from such a Timothy. It has been suggested by many, and it seems to me very credible, that Onesiphorus may have, ha- having come and associated with Paul, fallen into trouble himself. At the time of this writing, he may well have been imprisoned, awaiting execution, or even already been martyred. We can't be sure about that, but everything Paul says may agree with that. He speaks strictly in the past tense. He doesn't say, Onesiphorus is not ashamed of my chains, as if that's a continuing situation, but he was not ashamed of my chains, as if it's a eulogy of a man who, who is now no longer with us. Certainly, if Onesiphorus had come and then abandoned Paul, Paul would not later write these positive things about it. He came, but he's not there anymore. It's interesting that he wishes mercy on the man's household, but not on the man himself. Although later he wishes on the man himself. But he starts off with him, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of the owner of Cyprus, perhaps his wife and children, his survivors. You could possibly deduce. For he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chain. When he arrived in Rome, he sought me very diligently and found me. And then the statement, May the Lord grant him that he might find mercy of the Lord in that day, could be almost a, a posthumous well-wishing for him. You know, if he has died, you know, well, now all he has to look forward to is the day of judgment, and I trust God will show mercy and remember his, his loyalty on, on that day. For you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Now, there is nothing in here that compels us to believe on that on the was now dead, but there are many questions that would arise if he is not dead, which are answered by the supposition that he is dead. That, uh, he talks so much in the past tense, he doesn't indicate that Onesiphorus is still with him or continuing to not be ashamed of him and so forth. And it is therefore possible that he's telling Timothy, you know, uh, I was visited by another friend of yours as I'm asking you to come to me now. He was not ashamed and I'm asking you not to be ashamed. And if Onesiphorus was now martyred and, and deceased, then... Uh, 